Good evening, church. Welcome. We're delighted to have you join us tonight. We're going to be taking a look at uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. We also want to spend some time singing and praying and uh, holding ourselves up to the Lord. So let's ask his presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We rejoice in you. You give us life and you gave us life abundantly in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We celebrate and praise your holy name. We invite you to come and sit with us. Join with us, worship with us this night. Lead us and teach us, make our minds and our hearts alive with your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing with us, I know it feels funny to sing alone at home, but you'll get over it.
praise the Lord. We're uh, going to take a minute or two and reset some things, and then we're going to come back and spend some time in prayer. Uh, lots, of, lots of things to pray about this week. We had a friend who lost a father, and uh, we've got uh, folk that have been struggling with COVID and others that are struggling with respiratory viruses. All of these things, all of these things add up, and we want to hold them and you up to the Lord. If you have something to pray about, be sure to let us know. Uh, we'll be happy to pray for you. We won't mention your name. We don't want to embarrass anybody. Sounds like they're having fun in the park. <laughs> nice warm day. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We rejoice in you. You have given us life and given us life abundantly. You have planted us in a beautiful place, a place with sunshine and warm skies, a place that experiences a little snow. We have moisture and we have crops and we have trees that are starting to bud. Jesus, these things are part of your plan for us. Help us to celebrate the goodness and the mercy that is shown to us in the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Earnestly, Lord, earnestly, we, we plead with you on behalf of those who are grieving. Um, we, we remember them and hold them up before you, Lord. Uh, Comfort them. Give them strength in the midst of, of the trial of losing a family member. And Lord, we do pray on behalf of those that are struggling with viruses and COVID and respiratory illnesses. And oh Lord, the, the list just goes on with all the problems of life that swirl around us. Bless, comfort, keep each and every one of these. Oh, Lord, we do pray your power and your presence down over Waterville. Open our eyes, open our hearts, cause us to, to revive in spirit and in love for you. Help us to throw aside the, the cults that, that we get ourselves involved in, the things that we, we give attention to that are not a part of your kingdom and not, are, not a part of your purpose for us. Oh, Lord, we do pray earnestly. Open the eyes of our government leaders, our president, our vice president, our Congress, our Senate, our governor, and our state representatives. Hold them accountable, Jesus. Wake them up and cause them to see the light of your glory. Help them to seek your word as, as the guide for their life. We do earnestly pray, Lord. We do earnestly pray that you would bring revival to this nation, that you would pour down your Holy Spirit, that you would fill this land with the warmth of your presence. Oh, Jesus, start with Waterville. Go right down the main streets of town. Follow the highway through town. Make it holy as a path unto you and your glory. We do ask, oh Lord, that you would grant us your favor, that you would grant us an understanding and a fullness of the power of your presence and, and a hope in what you can do to change our land and our people, to change the politics that drive our country and, and the decisions that are ridiculous that are made by school systems and by government agencies. They use our money to do these things. So help stop them. Oh, Jesus, earnestly we pray that your presence would fall down upon our EMTs and our, upon our emergency responders, our fire department, our police protection. These people provide services for us that are essential to life and, and they help protect us from, from the bad things that happen in life. Help them to be present and safe in conducting their duties. Oh Lord, teach us this night. 
we, we hold you up and we ask that you would make our lives and our hearts come alive. That you would show us the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to be looking at Luke 19. Uh, this passage, we want to start with verse 28. Uh, it's a longer passage. Luke 19, 28. After he said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of All that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put it, Jesus on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Turn the lights out, Irma. <laughs> We're having to adjust some lights here. So, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead the week before. He was at a banquet in Simon the leper's home, and Lazarus was there, and Mary poured the spikenard over Jesus' uh, body, over his head especially, and his hair and his feet, and she mopped up that perfume with her hair. And... And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, Jesus is on his way as being introduced as the king of Israel. And he said in the, in the last part of that passage that if they had recognized, if they had seen the, the calling of God on that particular day, righteousness might come, deliverance might come. But now it's hidden from them. You see, the turmoil, the turmoil that brought Jesus to Jerusalem is horrendous in its power. It's beyond our imagination because here they saw Lazarus raised from the dead, immediately went back to the temple and began to plot how to kill him. You, you've got to shrug your shoulders and, and scratch your head and say, what is wrong with these people? Well. Same thing that was wrong with them in the days of Noah. Same thing that's wrong with them today. When you choose rebellion and sin, the results are devastating. So Jesus sent the disciples ahead, and they came back with a colt of a donkey. Now, wait a minute. Why in the world would a donkey's colt be essential to the arrival in Jerusalem. Well, the kings of Israel were forbidden from riding horses and multiplying horses, even though Solomon did so.
And in the middle of all of that, they quite literally rebelled against God in every way imaginable. And so we have, first of all, this humble animal because it is commanded of God. And David rode a burrow. And when he declared Solomon as king, he put Solomon on his own burrow and sent him into the city. And you look at that and you say, wow. And so Jesus, following that tradition and fulfilling prophecy in the Old Testament, he sent his disciples ahead and told them, go into the village of Bethel, Bethage and Bethany. They were side by side. And you will find a burrow tied there and the cult of a burrow and bring him and, and they did they they went to the city they found they found the colt they untied him they brought him to jesus and jesus sat on him and jesus they they put they put their coats their cloaks on him And he rode, he rode that colt, unbroken, never been sat on. He rode it by the power of his creative hand into Jerusalem as king. And they sang to him, they sang praises to him. And Matthew tells us they sang Hosanna, which is to say, help, I pray. And when they sang Hosanna, they also sang from Psalms a whole series of songs that are dedicated to the King of Israel, quite literally committed to him. And you have to, you have to look at that and you have to say, wow. All of this is laid out in Scripture, every bit of it. Every bit of this was laid out in Scripture. And Jesus came into Jerusalem, literally, on the colt of a donkey. Literally, by the power of the Holy Spirit fulfilling the fullness of Scripture and carrying out in, in God's name the fullness of everything. that was prophesied. Why? Why all this display? Why all of this fanfare? Why all of this celebration? Well, the passage here tells us that they were celebrating all the miracles that Jesus had performed. They were giving praise to God for what it is that Jesus had done. And we have a picture, a snapshot of what it's like for the coronation of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And with that snapshot, the hope the hope of seeing God's redemption come in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. And you look at Jerusalem, and here's this glorious city. Uh, it is sitting on a hill, a spit of land that slopes off. And that spit of land had been built on since way before David's time, occupied as a city. And it became the city of David because that's where he put his throne. And those hallowed walls 
were torn down once by the Babylonians, built back, and ready to be torn down again by the Romans, quite literally. And Jesus is looking at this place. The place where God crowned his king, David. The place where God anointed prophet after prophet after prophet. And they tormented them and they tortured them and they killed them. Isaiah walked around in the city naked, literally laid on his side and prophesied built siege walls, pretend siege walls against the city, warning them of the judgment that was coming because of their rejection of the power of the presence of God. Jeremiah, they took and threw him to a pit of mire and clay and left him there to starve to death. And so the list, so the list goes onward. In the city... Hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people, depending on the age and the time, who lived there, who worshipped there, who played there, who hoped there for the power of God, and they spent their time in the temple singing, praying, offering sacrifices. But their worship was false. It was based on their interpretation of rules and regulations, and those rules and regulation became more important than the people themselves and the city itself. And they became critical and condemning and manipulative. And when Jesus came along, they hated him with passion. Why? Because he had power, and they wanted it. It was all about what they wanted and not about Jesus and not about God. And so we have all these competing forces coming together in this city at the time that Jesus arrived. Celebrated for all of his miracles. Hated for all of his miracles. The contradictions abound. How could they not see that? How can we not see that? we got to ask those questions of ourselves because the fact is that in the city in the city people lived and died and worshipped and celebrated and pretended a religion that was based on their rules not on their faith. And you have to ask, why? Why were they so blind? Why are we so blind? The truth is that what goes around comes around and you see the same thing going on in churches today. Some worship some are so involved in, in a, a cult-like structure that celebrates an individual. Some are so involved in politics. Some are so involved in the things of this world and philosophies of humans and their ideas about what ought to be true righteously instead of what God says is true righteously. And all of these things, all of these things, they, they add up, they pile up. They become an enormous, an enormous pile of silliness. And Jesus broke that up. And he challenged it. And he turned it upside down. Literally, his kingdom was an upside down kingdom. It was about God, not about people, not about rules and regulations, but about what the love of God can accomplish. And so in Jerusalem, J 
Jesus came to the finish of his ministry. And in Jerusalem, the city of David, people celebrated his arrival. His disciples put their cloaks on that burrow and they put Jesus on that burrow. And when they did, they rode him into the city singing songs and hymns. That Hosanna song, yeah. That's sang when they bring the Lamb of Sacrifice in to the temple during Holy Week. And when they sang it, everyone started singing because they were waiting on the Lamb of Sacrifice for Passover to arrive not understanding that Jesus really is the Passover lamb, really is the one who brings honor and glory and power to the world around, who brings deliverance and hope and salvation, that Jesus is really the one who, in the middle of that desert, came to glorify God, mounted on a donkey, actually on the colt of a donkey that had never been rode. And all of this, and all of this was paramount to his introduction as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But the King of Kings and Lord of Lords' mission was not political. It wasn't to throw out the Romans. It was to change lives. It was to transform people and turn them into God's glorious reign. The fullness of the power of God upon them on that day. And they did not see it. They shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Because Jesus indeed was that King. Jerusalem is a lot like Waterville. I don't know if you've had the privilege of being there, but the Mount of Olives is about like Badger Mountain. If you had to walk straight up Badger Mountain and walk straight down Badger Mountain, you have just experienced the road from the top of Mount of Olives down into the Kidron Valley to the city of Jerusalem. 22% grade. Horde grade. Impossible to walk. And Jesus rode his burrow down that steep slope, down into the valley. And Jesus showed the people what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is like. He isn't there as a political king. He isn't there to change the politics of the place though we want him to do that here. He's there to change hearts and to change lives and to transform people and to make people new in the fullness of the power of the presence of his Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's Jesus. And yes, he was sitting on a donkey on the foal, the colt of a donkey. And yes, people praised him and sang out to him and worshiped him. And the Pharisees didn't like it. They, they really actually rather despised what he was doing and what happened. And they told him to shut his disciples up. 
because they were singing the praises that went with the sacrificial lamb of Passover. And the Pharisees were too spiritually blind to see that Jesus was, in fact, their plans to kill him were, in fact, making him the Passover lamb. And so Jesus wrote on. But, you know, when the Pharisees objected, Jesus told them that if these be quiet, if these are silent, the stones themselves will cry out because all creation was celebrating the arrival of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't just the 120 that followed Jesus around. It wasn't just the people who saw and experienced the, the miracles like Simon the leper and like Lazarus. It was the whole of creation, the whole of nature that celebrated the coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we look at Jesus and we realize how we have failed him ourselves. And we realize his purpose in coming is not our purpose too many times and in too many ways. His purpose is not our purpose. And he was there to give his life on our behalf. He was there to pay the penalty of our sins in full by the power of his own blood. And all of this celebration and all of this fuss about the arrival of Jesus and all of this glorious fulfillment of prophecy came because he was God in the flesh and there was no other. His fullness, his power, his purpose, all came because he was king of the universe. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the fullness of time, deliverance came, and they did not see it. They did not see the visitation of the Lord. Peace was in the offering. Jesus said that, if you had only known He came down the Mount of Olives on that burrow. And he stretched out his hand over the city. And when he looked at the city sitting on that burrow, you cannot not see that city. Mount of Olives, like it is here, there's not much there except the olive trees that are planted and deeply rooted. But Jesus, but Jesus rode in, displaying, portraying, fulfilling the fullness of the power of the presence of God in a way
that we can only begin to imagine. And that power that he portrayed, that he brought in on that spring day, he sat there and he looked at that city And he wept because he didn't see the glorious white walls the way we see the glorious white walls. He didn't see the glorious olive trees that are hundreds of years old and been there for what seems like an eternity. He saw the sin. He saw the sin. And when he saw the sin, he wept. And he cried out over the city because he knew, he saw what was coming. You see, and, and it says it very clearly at the end of that passage. It says it very clearly that he saw the truth that was hidden from their eyes and that peace was in the offering, but Jesus saw the destruction of the city and he saw that the children would suffer as a result of the parents and their foolishness. He saw this. And so when we're looking at the city of Jerusalem, in Jesus' eyes, it's full of fire. And it will burn. And it will burn from the top to the bottom. And that's exactly what the Romans did. They set a siege wall around the city. They built up siege ramps. They bombarded the city walls until they broke with huge stones that weighed a thousand pounds each. And when they did that, when they did that, they busted through and they burned the city. A few years ago, there was a picture that showed up in the archaeology digests. And that picture was of a home, and in the corner stood a spear and a niche in the wall where the spear stayed so that it point was protected. And on the front of the house, in Hebrew, was my last name. They unearthed that house, and that house had burned, and inside of it was a woman and a man and a child. And that's what Jesus saw. And that's why Jesus wept. We cannot imagine how painful it was to him to know this. And to know he's dying for their sins, but in their sins they have rejected the coming of the Lord. And fire will take the city. Let's pray. O oh Lord, earnestly open our eyes. Help us to see what it is that Jesus wants in our lives, in our nation, in our world. Help us to take his gospel out into the rest of the earth and to experience the power of deliverance that is ours in his blood. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with us again next week. We hope to see you. Lord bless you for the week. Have a great week.